over. My eldest son, Duryodhana, is dead. My hundred sons are dead. All their children are dead. All their armies, their battalions, their generals are dead. To hell with the state of humanity. To hell with the human body. All the woes that we suffer in this life arise from the very state of humanity. How can I go on? I am condemned to wander without eyes over this ravaged earth, and the only sound I hear is the sound of the teeth of the carnivorous creatures devouring corpses. Where is justice? Dhritarashtra, your sorrow causes your lips to burn, and your wisdom is destroyed. With that sorrow, you even regard death as preferable to life. You now have to take your son's enemy, the victor of this war, your nephew, Kudishtara, in your arms. You have to help him reign over this kingdom, which was once yours. As for me, now that the war is over, I have to follow my path. I have to leave you and spend my last days in the woods. You helped me day after day during that terrible battle. Without you, how can I live? Dharma, justice, the law. Dharma will help you. The sun is slowly rising over the battlefield covered by endless heaps of corpses. This victory is a defeat. What have we done? The golden breastplates and the jewels of the warriors glitter in the sun. The earth is covered by their lances, their bows, their arrows, and the sharp steel of their swords. Some of the warriors are standing upright, glued together. Some are glued to the earth. The battlefield is invaded by blood-hungry creatures. Vultures, birds of prey, dripping with blood, seize their feet, tear them apart, and devour them by the millions. These uh, insatiable war enemies invade the battlefield with their insatiable appetite. These tiger-like men are now extinguished fires. They're lying in soft beds, and now they lie in the earth, only softened by their blood. Hear the vultures and the jackal's cries, only caught by the deaf ears of the dead. These sinister and cruel enemies invade the battlefield with their insatiable appetite. Sometimes the vampires do not dare touch bodies that are still intact. They think those ones are still alive! Tears, they lament, wandering in all directions, striking themselves violently. The earth is covered by heads, 
hands and limbs all twisted together in great heaps. Seeing that terrible sight, they go out of their minds. In their madness, after putting a head on a corpse without seeing another one nearby, they shout, It is not his! Fighting off the vampires, they put together arms, thighs, feet. <clears throat> Even when they see their husbands, they do not recognize them. Another task is waiting for me. I must do what needs to be done. Let the ablations be made for our pet. Let our priests burn them and throw their ashes into the river Ganga. Let our women pray for their families. Let them cry and shout their despair aloud. Let the earth hear that sad complaint. Let her be happy. She has won. There are no more warriors disturbing her peace on the battlefield. You just jumped. Yes, Mother Rose. There's still another person left. One person left? Yes. You must make the ablation for him to my son. I do not understand. I remember all our dead only too well. Surely I am not so ungrateful as to forget something. Who is this person to whom an ablation for me is due? It is Karnak. You must make the ablation for him also. Karnak? He was not one of us. His father was a charioteer. The funeral rite should be performed by him. Why would you have me do it for this man who was our arch enemy? Please tell me, mother, why should I do it? My son, because Karna was of noble birth. Of noble birth, mother, you know nothing of Karna. How do you know that he was of noble birth? Then you must know who he was. Tell me, mother, who was the father of Karna? Who was he? Who was the mother of Karna? Who was the woman who was so heartless that she would abandon her child to the river Ganga the moment of his birth? Who was the woman who ruined the life of that great man? You must know because you are telling me the details of this crime. Tell me, mother, who was she? Let down 
power is prime. To not his nature be disloyal to his king, his master, friend, your cousin, Duryodhana. He suffered agonies knowing he was your brother. Knowing who he was, he let you win. What are you doing? I am going into the woods. Do you intend to give up your kingdom? Yes! I will go into the woods. I will eat fruits and roots. I will wash twice a day. Call him in the face. Without tears, without joy, like an idiot, wandering aimlessly, seeking neither death nor life. Don't! Go. I am begging you. Remember before the war you asked for something? What can save the world? You. You are the only one. The world needs a king who will be calm and just. I want this king. Without him, I am lost. Am I this king? Yes. Destruction never comes weapon in hand. It comes slyly on tiptoe, making us see bad and good and good and bad. Anyway, you won't have a choice between peace and war. What will my choice be then? Between a war and another war. This other war, where will it take place? On the battlefield or in my heart? I don't see a real difference. The earth will need you, my son. She will enjoy your victories. She will need you to wake up again, to recover her harmony, her beauty, her calm. Where is Yudhishthira? Lead me to him. Yudhishthira fit to be cursed. He kneels before you. I am the one who must be cursed. The guilt is mine. My heart must have been made of stone, not to explode, as I was told, day after day, the details of this terrible massacre. I listened to no one. To none of the voices who told me, stop this hatred. Hold back the greed of your son. I was mad not to listen. My son was cruel. His egoism was insatiable. It had no limits. He had only one word on his lips, war. And I loved him. That love had no limits. I followed his madness. Now every one of our children has been destroyed. This morning I, I could see no other way than to die. But now I see clearly, even without my eyes, that my duty is the reverse. Despite this terrible battle, I did not bear you any hatred, but only love. I must take you into my arms. You are not my son, and as your father, I must help you in your duty to become the king that everyone awaits. No, father. The kingdom is yours. You are the king. My dear son, I told you before the war that your victory would burn you day and night, for you have destroyed your family. You have to be king. You cannot escape your destiny. You know that there is still one man alive on the battlefield who could convince you. Bishma, your grandfather. He is lying on a bed of arrows that pierced his body. He is waiting for the day of his death that can only arise when the solstice returns. When you were a child, you wanted so much to learn from him. In his mind, he is calling you. Go to him. Yes, my son. Go to him.
I heard that your understanding is clouded by the many doubts you have. How can my understanding not be clouded when I am the cause of your dying, grandfather? I fought against you. Millions and millions of men have perished on my account. I cannot find any peace of mind. I believe Brahma created men to do evil. What makes you think you teach like that? The Creator is responsible for all a man does. Above all for his crimes, we must see things as they are. The Creator is not implicated in actions. And for he who knows this, all bad actions cease. He who knows this knows that it is his nature that acts. And acts in obedience to the laws of great nature. One day, Gopi finds her son dead. A hunter arrives with a snake carefully tied up. Madam, this snake killed your son. Should I cut it now into little pieces, or should I throw it into the fire? Bring him up. Killing him won't bring back my son. Don't do it any harm. Let him go. Madam. You seem to know the difference between right and wrong, and your noble soul is touched by the suffering of any creature. But I haven't a noble soul. I'm just a practical hunter, and I'm going to kill this snake. Give me your leave to do so. It was my son's destiny to die, so I can't authorize you to kill this snake. Be merciful. Free him and let him go. An enemy deserves to die. Killing an enemy brings one merit, in this life as well as the next. Pardon brings even more. This snake is a killer! If I kill this snake, thousands of lives will be saved. But not my son. Sexless hunter! What have I done? I'm only a snake. I have no free will. I have not committed any crime. Yama, the goddess of death, sent me to do what I did. If you have to blame somebody, blame her. her. Maybe. But you accepted to do it. You're the instrument of the crime. The potter's wheel is the unique cause of the pot's existence. And you are the reason this child died. You are guilty. You admit it. So you must die. The potter's wheel is not the only cause of the making of a pot. And I'm not entirely the cause of the death of the child. Two causes, or even more, can operate together. I'm not guilty of any crime. My crime results from interlinked causes. I don't know the difference between a primary cause or an interlinked one. But I know well that your bite killed this child. You are guilty. You admit it, so you must die. Do you think that when a crime is committed, its author is not responsible? Tell me what you think of this! Primary cause or not, nothing happens without a somewhere on the way cause. And you're right, I am that somewhere on the way cause. But I believe the real one is the one who incited me. Young, death. You talk too much. At this precise moment, death itself arrives. What are you talking about? I am Yama, death. More than anyone else, I have no free will. If you want to blame somebody, blame the one who is really responsible. Time. Wait. If time is the real responsible one, and not you, death, why do we spend all our lives trying to ignore you? Or is time responsible for that as well? At this point, Suddenly, time appears. Neither the snake nor death, and not even me, time, with all my power, are responsible for the death of that child. It is destiny who is responsible. Destiny. Destiny leads us all. I free him. I told you from the start it was destiny who was the cause of my son's death. Destiny governs us all. What happened on the battlefield was not your fault, nor that of your enemies. The earth called on destiny to exterminate all these heroes. 
She suffered too long for being trampled on. My arrogant men, and you, have to serve them. Was it just? Was the Earth's demand just? What is it to be truly just? How can one be truly just? You are the son of Dharma. Dharma is justice, the law. He is in the heart of all creatures. So often, he is not heard. Being born like that, you always want to be just. To be sure it is just to be just. You are always searching for the truth. And not being satisfied by easy answers or lies. So unhappy when you have to lie. So you go on and on with your search. It's not easy to be born to, by justice. It is rare. Sometimes it is even very painful. Once, a falcon spent many long hours chasing a splendid vision. Why are you in such a hurry, Worm? What are you afraid of? 
of a chariot, sir. I hear it coming. It's going to crush me. I must get to the side. I can hear the crack of the whip. Life is precious. I have no intention of dying if I can avoid it. I don't want to lose this paradise of life for the hell of death. But you are only a worm. What do you know about the paradises of life? The joys of sound, smell, taste, touch. They have no need for you. You'd be better off dead. You see, sir, despite all that you tell me, I like my life. I'm used to it. I love it. And even if I am only a worm, I still have my pleasures. In a previous life, I was very rich. I had a very bad character. I was cruel and vulgar. I cheated my, many of my friends. The prosperity of others drove me mad. I hated their fortunes, their houses, their beautiful wives. But I did love my mother. And it happened to me to give shelter to a holy man. And then I got old, just like a father who has lost his son. I repented. Obviously, that didn't work out so well. But I'm sure that one day, if I deserve it, I shall obtain liberation. Wait. Listen. A man is walking through a dark, dangerous forest filled with wild beasts. The forest is surrounded by a vast net. He is afraid. He runs to escape from the animals. He falls into a pitch black hole. By the miracle, he is caught on some twisted roots. He can feel the hot breath of an enormous snake with its jaws wide open lying at the bottom of the he is about to fall into the shell. On the edge of the hole stands a large elephant waiting to crush him. Laughing like mice and all the roots in which the man is hanging. Fingers, bees fly over the poles, falling drops of money. The man, slowly cautiously, the man holds out his finger to catch the falling drops of money. Threatened by many dangers, hardly a breath between him and so many deaths. The man still can't draw the chain. God of Honey holds him to life. Despite all his senses in that wilderness, the man had never at any time was his hope of giving up. That man was in a terrible situation, I understand. So with the greatest respect, I must leave you. You see, if it is my destiny to die under the wheel of a chariot, well, this time I must try and avoid it. Sun is approaching in solstice. The hour of my death has come. Mm -hmm. 
Dhritarashtra. So, you know all the duties of a king. There is nothing you do not know. Wise as you are, you should not grieve for the death of your sons. It was fate. Even if you cannot see it, a life has been saved. Continue, Forget your sorrow. Your firstborn, Kanda, loved you. He understood you. Do not grieve. Dishtara, grandson, don't despise yourself. You are the most upright. You are the truest of men. It needed this harsh battle within yourself, your doubts, and this terrible war for you to become the king that the city awaits. Grant me leave. I will now cast off my body. Faces lit up by an unearthly smile. He closes his eyes, leans his head back. He holds back his life breaths and wills himself to die. But then the life breaths of Bhishma, piercing through the crown of his head, shoot up into the sky. They rise up and are lost in the clouds. A cool breeze blows. The earth breathes. A strange peace fills the hearts of men as the soul of Bhishma goes on its journey. The ever-present Krishna, who has suddenly appeared, says, Excellent! Excellent! A great funeral pyre is built, and the body of Bhishma is cremated. Bhishma's bones and ashes are taken to the banks of his mother, the river country. Suddenly, the waters part and Ganga herself appears. She re-enters the water 
and the river flows peacefully once more. Vishtara is crown king. He performs an extraordinary sacrifice. According to the laws of kings, he distributes all his riches to the priests. And then a small animal enters. A mongoose, half covered in gold. She throws herself into what is left from the great sacrificial fire. What are you doing, mongoose? passed under King Yudhishthira's reign, and the people were very happy. The Dhrashtara was treated with the utmost respect. Yudhishthira tried all the time to make him happy. He issued no orders except with his approval. In the administration of the affairs of the state, he conducted himself so as to give him the feeling that in truth, the kingdom was ruled by him. Fifteen years had passed, when one day, Yudhishthira discovered that his uncle was fasting and sleeping on the ground. I did not know. I did not know that you were fasting and sleeping on the ground, mortifying your flesh in this man. I believe you were well looked after and happy. My dear son, it is time for me to go into the woods. I can no longer stay under your roof. You treated me as your father. You offered me everything you could offer. My heart desires silence. As my king, give me permission to go into the woods. You ask for my permission to go? How can I give or refuse permission to you? Do not desert me. Let him 
Inga live amongst the Kanila flowers of the forest. The Dharma of Kings is to die in battle or spend their last days in the forest. You are too young for that. The time has come for him, my son. And for me too. The time has come. I must go into the forest, sparing my body and build, engaging in the performance. I do not try to change my mind. I am firm. Strange indeed is this purpose of yours. I ask you not to accomplish it. It is your duty to show me some compassion. You wish to abandon me to the kingdom? I do not desire the fruits of that sovereignty which has been won by you. I wish to attain my penance, peace in my heart. How will you live in the inaccessible woods? I desire to waste my body through penance. My son, let your understanding always be devoted to righteousness. Let my mind be free. So be it, The next morning, Dhritarashtra, followed by Panti, left for the forest, burned by all the city. One day, Yudhishthira decided to go to the forest. He reached the place where his uncle and mother were fasting. They were very happy to see him. They offered him roots and fruits. Does your peace, your self-restraint, your tranquility of heart grow? Is my mother able to serve you without fatigue and trouble? Will, O King, her residence in these woods be productive of fruits? I hope you no longer give way to grief for your children, all of whom have been slain on the field of battle. Do you still accuse me who is responsible for their slaughter? My dear son, all that is in the past. There is no more grief in my heart. Jistra! Jistra! That is the voice of my beloved uncle, Vaduro. I knew that after the war he came here. You must know where he is. My dearest brother Vidura is mortifying himself and is living on just air. He lives in the heart of the forest and does not come here anymore. If you go deep into the woods, you will find him. I went towards Vidura. He was not the old Vidura I knew. His body was a bundle of bones, and he was almost dying. But his eyes were glowing with a strange intensity. I went to him, I said, I am Yudhishthira, my lord, speak to me. He stood there, leaning against a tree. I found myself compelled to look into his eyes. Our four eyes were locked for a while. His eyes burned into mine. I could not bring myself to withdraw my eyes from his eyes. And then a strange thing happened. I felt myself stronger and wiser. I felt myself different. I felt I was more Vidura than myself. I realized that he had died, and that he had entered my body and had abandoned his. Dura has died. I wanted his body to be cremated. But then I heard his voice say, No, do not cremate my body. For it is part of you now. 
I feel an inexpressible gratitude. I have always wanted to go into the woods. But now I know I must serve the destiny which has been given to me. I must go back to the city. I see a whole army rising out of the river. All my sons, their wounds healed, reconciled. An immense wave of men, all white, mounting into the air. Eighteen years have passed since the death of the elders, when Yudhishthira starts to see the same omens that were seen just before the great battle. Fathers and mothers slay their children. Girls of six and seven give birth. Boys of eight become fathers. Trees, dry and barren, are bereft of fruits and flowers. 
Winds, dry and strong, showering gravel and stones blow from every side. Wild animals invade the cities. Birds wheel, make circles from right to left. Rivers run in opposite directions. Fog is always on the horizon. When they rise, the rays of the sun are blocked by the trunks of headless men. Circles of light can be seen each day around the moon and the sun. These circles have three hues. Black, ashen, blood red. Martin Dan, is it true that this world will be destroyed? It has happened already, and it will happen again and again. When neither the sun nor the moon nor fire nor earth nor air nor sky remain, when all the world being destroyed look like one vast ocean, <coughs> I alone remain. I wandered through that gray, misty swamp, and my heart became dry. I could find no living creature and nowhere to rest. And months and months of traveling through that water. Suddenly, one day, I came upon a vast banyan tree. And there, sitting at the foot of that tree, I saw a boy. Wonder filled my heart. I asked myself, how does this boy sit here all alone when all the world has been destroyed? And although I have knowledge of the past, present, and future, I did not understand who he was or why he was sitting here. He smiled at me and said, Oh, Margindea, I see that you cannot find rest. Come into my body. I dropped into the belly of that boy. Belly of that boy, I saw mountains, rivers, oceans. I saw people, cities, kingdoms. I saw the firmament. I, I saw the sun, the moon, planets, stars, galaxies. In the belly of that boy, I saw everything. I traveled for years in the stomach of that child, and I never found its limits. I was wrapped with anguish because I could not understand the meaning of it all. And I could find no rest. I cried out to the boy for help. And at once I was ejected from his mouth and I found myself sitting next to him. And he gratified me with a big smile and said, Oh, Mark and Dana, you are too impatient. Having dwelt so little time in my body, you did not find the rest you were looking for. Come closer. Listen. I will now tell you who I am and all you wish to know. 